Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. It has been a busy, busy January with 30 plus live events connecting classrooms with scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists from all over the world. We're so excited to have everybody joining us for today's live event. If you've been following along the last few months, preparations have been underway for the Endurance 22, or 22 Expedition. Uh, on a mission to find Ernest Shackleton's lost ship in the Weddell Sea in Antarctica. We've had a lot of fun so far connecting with people like Chad, who's working behind the scenes on some of the equipment, like the drones uh, and AUVs that they're going to be using underwater to search for the shipwreck. We've talked to John Shears, who's the expedition leader, and he gave us a really good intro to the expedition and what it takes to get an expedition like this underway. And today we've got another great event in store. Before we introduce our speaker, I wanna share a couple of links. We are partnered with these education events with Reach the World. So if you haven't already registered your classroom to keep up to date with the Endurance 22 um, updates, you can do it right here. I'm gonna pop this link up on the screen. You'll find more information about the upcoming expedition. You'll find the events that are coming up. You'll find great journals and all kinds of information from those who will be on board the expedition, which go, gets underway in early February. So do check out that link if you haven't already, and I will share it one more time at the end of the event. So I see lots of voices already saying hi in the chat. Keep those uh, greetings coming. We'll work in some of your questions when the time comes. I see we've got classes here in Ontario and Canada. Uh, we've also got classes joining us in St. Louis, Missouri, in Stony Plain, Alberta. Looks like we have someone joining us uh, in Cornwall in the UK. So great to have so many joining us live today. Today we are joined by Menson Bound. He is an accomplished marine archaeologist. He's traveled the world in search of famous shipwrecks. He spent a career searching for answers that can only be found underwater. He is a fellow of the Explorers Club. He will be the Director of Exploration for Endurance 22 Expedition. This journey will take them into the Weddell Sea off Antarctica in February 2022 in search of Sir Ernest Shackleton's lost ice ship, the Endurance. So I'm going to bring Menson in right now, joining us from the UK. Hey, Menson, how are we doing today? Hey, Joe. Good morning, students. All right. Well, it's great to have you joining us live today. We've got a great group of students across North America uh, joining us. Some of them are joining us live via YouTube. And then we have a whole bunch more in camera spots who we're going to take some live questions from today. So Menson, I have some slides prepared. I'm gonna bring them up in just a moment. But before I start with the slides, I would like to start with a question. And that question is, what led you to a career in marine archeology? span <laughs> Oh, that's a long one. But uh, when I was a kid growing up in the Falkland Islands, I used to read these articles in National Geographic magazine written by a great American archeologist, George Bass. And I used to write letters to him. And I kept doing that throughout my teens. And uh, eventually one day I received, when I was at Oxford, a student at Oxford, I got a, I got a telegram from George saying, did I have Siemens papers? And actually I did because I worked at sea before I went to university. And George invited me to join him in Turkey. He just uh, acquired a ship out there and needed people who were divers, who were archaeologists, but also uh, accredited seamen. So I sort of filled each of those hats kind of thing. And I joined him and we spent a summer going up and down the coast of Turkey, putting into little fishing villages, talking to fishermen, sponge divers, seeing if they'd found any ancient ships at all. Sometimes they had, more often they hadn't. And it was a great and glorious way to get started in, in underwater archaeology. And from then I went on to work with the French, the Italians, and eventually the Brits. And then I set up my own team. All right, very cool. Well, I'm going to share some pictures here. Uh, and we'll just briefly kind of touch a little bit uh, on some of your, your adventures. So, you know, you really get to uncover some amazing history uh, on the bottom of the ocean. And so, you know, this is, this is your office sometimes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, my office, okay. Yeah, I can live with that. Uh, it's where I spend a lot of my life. I really enjoy myself. Nothing gets me more enthusiastic than shipwrecks. And I'm looking at the photograph you feature right here, and that wreck, was incredible. It was within a live, active volcano. And uh, it was all the time sort of blowing bubbles and things like that. And we were able to insert eggs 
in the seabed at the beginning of the dive and very gingerly take them out at the end of the dive. And we could sit on the boats afterwards and eat boiled eggs for breakfast. I mean, there's no other wreck site in the world where you can do that. But that was a wreck off uh, off the north of uh, Sicily. Island All right. Island. Very cool. Um, and then so, you know, when you're out on the water, you're on very different vessels from, you know, small to really large. This one looks like kind of a barge here with a lot of equipment yeah. on it. Yeah, that's that's true. Uh, we, uh, I used to work a lot from big flat top barges like that. We used to design them to to our needs. And you can see at the front there, we're raising an iron cannon. It's coming up with the crane. You can see the stage on the other side of the vessel. We use that to lower divers to and from the seabed. And right there we are in the Straits of Malacca, one of the most difficult places in the world to dive. The currents are furious. It's like swimming in liquid chocolate. I mean, you can't see anything, no visibility whatsoever. But it was a great wreck. It was a Dutch East Indiaman, which had sunk in battle. So it was all, there were all these cannons everywhere. And some of the cannons had actually, the ship had gone down in flames. And some of the cannons, the bronze cannons, had actually melted. Wow. But it's a very exciting wreck. All right. So there's a few more pictures from there. This is a very different kind of diving than what we saw earlier. Can you tell us a little bit about this kind of diving? Yeah, that one is, let's see, that's, uh, that was the Hoi An wreck. That was an incredible wreck in, this, in the South China Sea uh, off the coast of Vietnam. And we started off using mixed gas that you see us using there in that picture. It was very, very deep indeed. In fact, it, it, it is and was the, the deepest uh, underwater excavation, hands-on excavation that there's ever been. And we used mixed gas to start with, such as you see us in there, but then we changed the saturation diving, which is much more complicated, involves all sorts of life support systems and highly trained divers. And uh, But it allowed us to work so 24 hours a day around the clock. Divers would go into bells, which would carry them to the seabed. We'd bring them up. The bells would dock with the metal chamber and the divers would live at the pressure of the seabed for weeks on end. Uh, it was an incredible wow. wreck, too, full of porcelain. It was, it was a junk. Uh, we, we filled up literally two rice warehouses full of porcelain from that wreck. It was done for the uh, National Museum of Vietnam and took three seasons. Amazing. So there's one more picture here, and this looks like maybe seeing all suited up and kind of going down on that stage you talked about being lowered into the water. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Yeah, same, cool. same site, in fact, yeah. So, uh, you know, your time isn't all spent in the water. Then you kind of, you get up uh, on shore, you've, you've collected some amazing things, and then there's work to be done as well, isn't there? Yeah, there's the recording and the study of the artifacts, the conservation of the artifacts. That takes can take years. Um, but every item we find on the seabed is measured and then uh, measured into place. And that is plotted on, on the site plan. Uh, and then there are an awful lot of library hours where you've got to hit the books. And um, if any of you out there are thinking of becoming an archeologist, you've really got to enjoy reading history and just knowledge for its own sake. If you've got those qualities, then you know, maybe you could become an archeologist too. All right. And I'll escape the books. Yeah. So there's a couple pictures coming up here, just kind of showing off a few more things uh, that have come uh, from different wrecks. Oh, yeah. That one's interesting. By the way, the lady, uh, uh, my was my girlfriend, now my wife, Joanna. That's taken back in about 1981, something like that. Uh, an incredible story. I was working on um, a famous, famous shipwreck off the south of England called the Mary Rose. And I went to see the man who found the wreck, a guy called uh, Alexander McKee. He was a writer and I was in his study with him and he had a whole lot of little bits and pieces from the seabed in his study there. And I asked him what one piece was, where did he get it? And he got very interested and wanted to know why I selected that piece rather than all the others that were in there. And I told him, I told him it was an Etruscan amphora handle. I told him it could be dated to about 600, 500 BC. And I could see there was from a shipwreck or from the sea because it was covered in marine deposits. And from that, uh, I deduced that if it came from a shipwreck, that would be the oldest post-Bronze Age shipwreck in the world and therefore of outstanding archaeological importance. So he told me to talk to a man called Reg Valentine, who had found it in 1961. 
Uh, and I went to see Reg and he told me about the wreck, showed me photographs. And then my wife and I, my then girlfriend, we embarked on a period where we went around Europe trying to contact the divers who'd been on that wreck in 1961 and who'd recovered objects from it because I was trying to dememonstrate the importance of this wreck so that I could, I could get permission to survey and excavate it. And this one piece that's being held there in Joanna's hand, that is what's called a, a, a cothon. It was made in ancient Corinth, 600 BC, and we found that piece in Monte, in, um, Monte Carlo in the end. Wow. But that was the piece which allowed us to tightly date the wreck to 600 BC. It was a key piece. All right, and there's one last picture here. Looks like an, another piece, maybe from the same or a different wreck. Oh, that's my wife again, and that's from a different wreck. That was uh, a wreck in the Aeolian Islands, uh, which was full of black painted uh, pottery from, from the classical period of history. Um, and it was quite remarkable. It, it was just sprawling all over the seabed, all this black painted pottery, you know, cups, mugs, jugs, plates, um, lamps, things like that. And there you see Joe holding up the top part of a lekathos, an oil jar. Uh, it was an incredible sight. I'll never forget when I first dived that wreck, just seeing all that stuff sticking out of the sand. It was as if somebody said at the time the gods had been sitting down to dinner, then suddenly something had disturbed them and they'd, you know, rushed out of there, knocking over the tables in their, in their haste and sort of throwing all the crockery onto the floor. That's pretty much how we found it, crockery everywhere. All right. Well, let's jump a little bit into the future now, and let's talk a little bit about what's taking you to Antarctica and this man right here. Can yeah. you tell, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, just a brief bit about Shackleton and uh, the journey he undertook around 1915? Okay. Uh, the Shackleton story is a big one, so let's see if I can summarize it in a nutshell. Shackleton's goal was to cross the great white continent of Antarctica from one side to the other by way of the South Pole, starting in the Weddell Sea, ending up on the other side of the continent in the Ross Sea. Uh, two years before, Amundsen and Scott had reached the South Pole, and Shackleton thought that the only thing left in this world worth doing was crossing Antarctica. So on the 1st of August, 1914, on the very eve of World War I, the most destructive war in human history, he set off for Antarctica. But he never actually got to land at all because once he was within the Antarctic Ocean, his ship became enveloped uh, in the ice. And now we jump to the 18th of January, 1915, when he became beset. And for the next few months, the ship was just locked into the ice. And I have to say, for the first few months, things weren't so bad. They were well fed, they had plenty of food, they had books to read, they enjoyed music, they had a really good time right through winter. But when it came to August, things started to go wrong. The ice started to get very aggressive. It was on the move, it was opening and closing, clenching and unclenching <clears throat> and grinding together. The flows were coming together. Uh, in such a way that the vessel was getting <coughs> crushed. And in the end, it ripped off the uh, rudder post and the water started to go in and Shackleton had no choice but to abandon ship. And at that point, they took to the ice and for many months they lived in tents on the ice. Uh, the idea being that if they stayed there long enough, the ice would eventually carry them to the mouth of the Weddell Sea. You've got to remember the ice is not static. It's constantly on the move. It's moving in a sort of a... Um, let's say clockwise motion. It's called the gyre, the Weddell Sea gyre. But gradually it's also moving north. So if you stay with the ice long enough, you will be spat out into the, into the mouth of the Weddell Sea. <clears throat> and that's pretty much what happened to Shackleton. They got to the edge of the ice, then they took to three of their lifeboats, which they had taken from the Endurance. And then for six days it was, they were at sea. And that was probably the most hellish time they went through. Uh, they were in open boats, below zero temperatures, sea was churning with broken bits of ice. Uh, they were having a hell of a time navigating, the winds and currents were working against them. They were absolutely frozen, they were almost delirious with thirst, they had frostbite, there was exposure. Uh, some of the men went a little delirious, there was a lot of seasickness, you can imagine. But eventually they got to this 
horrible little rock, in fact, that you see in the photograph you just featured, Joe, called Elephant Island. But Shackleton very soon realized if they stayed on Elephant Island, they would die. Bit by bit, they'd be worn down. Even though they're penguins and seals there to eat, they would eventually perish. And so he spent a few days there um, regaining his strength, his health, and then he set off in one of his boats, the best one, called the James Caird, and he set off for South Georgia. He could have headed for the Falklands, which is a lot closer, 500 miles away, but to get to the Falkland Islands, he'd have had to sort of work across the face of the currents, the winds, and he knew he could not do it in that small boat that you see there in the photograph. So instead, he set off for South Georgia, which was 800 miles away, and he made it incredible feat of navigation in two weeks. But then he found himself on the wrong side of the island. And he couldn't get around the ends and the boat he had was just too dangerous. So the only thing for it was to cross over the center of the island because he knew on the other side of the island, there was a Norwegian whaling station called Stromnes. But the center of the island was covered in very, very high mountains. So for 36 hours, he and two of his colleagues, they climbed over the, the mountain chain and made it down into Stromnes. And it was there that they commandeered or borrowed, if you like, a whaling catcher, and with a volunteer crew, they set off for Elephant Island to try to rescue his men. But the ice got in the way, and they couldn't get through. So they set sail for the Falkland Islands, and then they made two more attempts in different boats to rescue the men on Elephant Island. And it wasn't until the fourth attempt on a Chilean boat called the Yelcho that they succeeded and got all the men back to Chile. Not one of Shackleton's men died. They all survived. Uh, and a remarkable story. The great escape, you might call it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the most remarkable stories of, of exploration and survival uh, in such a uh, wild and remote place on the planet. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You can see why there's so much, um, you know, allure and around the story and this desire to find Shackleton's ship, which brings us to present day. Uh, and this beautiful ship that's going to take you back to the Weddell Sea. Yep. We, uh, I don't know how much your students know there, Joe, but we did have an attempt in 2019 on this ship, the Agullus II. And I think we got fairly close to succeeding. We, we covered over half our search box and then we lost our principal search vehicle and long story, but that was the end of it. So here we are again in uh, 2022 and in a few days we're setting off again in this same ship the Agullus II uh the same captain Knowledge Benko the same ice skipper Freddie Latham uh John whom you've met already he'll be there uh you you've met uh Chad Bonney I think uh Chad's an yeah. old friend of mine we've done a lot of deep ocean work together all over the world Indian Ocean Pacific Atlantic he's a great friend of mine and there'll be a few others uh, and we're going to try again. But this time, it's all new equipment. The absolute latest. Yeah. So I'm just going through a couple shots. Uh, these are obviously probably from 2019. So there you are at the bow of the ship. And that ship yeah. can get through pretty thick ice, can it? Yeah. Uh, we were punching our way through ice, which is three meters thick. thick. Wow. Uh, we were encountering ice, which is five meters thick which uh, I'm not sure there's an icebreaker on earth that can get through that, but uh, we couldn't penetrate that kind of ice, but we were uh, chewing our way through ice. that was, yeah, three meters thick, which is very thick indeed. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of work that goes on uh, out on the ice and hopefully we'll be able to broadcast a little bit uh, yeah. from the ice this time around. We will be entering the, the Weddell Sea pack. This is what Shackleton called the worst part of the worst sea in the world. And it really is pretty um, intimidating stuff. It's just, it's, 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 it's where Shackleton was in the endurance. And we have to beat and clobber our way in to get to the spot where the ship sank. And that's the first challenge. All right. And it looks like you're not alone all the time. There's some company out there sometimes. Yeah, we have the daily penguins and we have emperor penguins. The ones you see there are dailies there. Uh, they're cheeky chappies. They will come up and investigate you. They'll come up and peck at your shoelaces. Uh, they're just curious. 
Whereas the emperor penguins, which are much bigger, much grander looking, they're sort of more, I don't know, more sober in their, their attitude and their behavior. But they too are very curious. They will come up and, and inspect you. I mean, uh, the good news is that we will not be eating penguins. Uh, we, the ship is very well provided with some of the best food I've ever had on a working ship before. So, um, yeah, but I think everybody on the ship, you, all of us, and, and I grew up with penguins, but I just can't help being enchanted by penguins. All right, very cool. And so just a couple shots here. Here's you and John's. If any of the students yep. had seen the previous advice or advance, you'll recognize John um, from a few yep. months ago. And then, yeah, I guess you're, is that the approximate coordinates for, for where you're hoping to find the wreck? Yeah. Um, the sign there actually gives the coordinates of, of Worsley's coordinates. Um, and that was prepared by the ice skipper. We, we reached the spot at five o'clock in the, in the, uh, in the morning everybody was asleep and i raced up to the bridge and there was freddie the ice skipper and he had that sign there okay. and he and i signed it then everybody else signed it and then later on we put it on the ice and you see there and that's john and i we sort of you know we kind of feel like we've made it you know yeah uh, but the thing is is this those coordinates are not really the exact coordinates of where the ship went down and that is my problem i'm the guy who's tasked with finding the ship and I began with those coordinates. And I, like everybody else, assumed that that was a sextant reading of the exact spot where the ship sank. But then during the research, I found out it wasn't quite that at all. In fact, on the day the ship went down, uh, it was overcast. And Frank Wellesley, the captain of the Endurance, their ace navigator, he couldn't get a position at all. And it wasn't until the next day that he took a position. And in the meantime, of course, the ice is moving all the time. Yeah. And then what Worsley did, he took that position and he applied to it what we called an offset. That is to say, he made an edu educated guess as to the direction of the flow of the ice and to its speed. And he applied that to his latitude and longitude. So it isn't an exact position that you see there in that photograph. But the uh, search box that we designed was was big enough to take all those, um, how shall I put it, variable uh, factors into consideration. And I think there's 90% likelihood that the wreck will be there somewhere within our search box, which is over 107 uh, square nautical miles. All right. So I'm going to bring us back now, Menson, and uh, you have one more uh, thing to show us. So we're, we're both fellows of the Explorers Club, and you're carrying a flag with you. Uh, on this yeah. expedition. Indeed, I'm so proud of this. Here we go. Here it is, guys. It's the Explorers Club. Now, my dear friend, Julianne Chase from the Explorers Club, she gets very angry if I hold it upside down. So I've got to hold this the right way around for you. I think it's that way. Joe, tell me, you're, in a, you're, you're a fellow of the Explorers that Club. That looks pretty good to me. Yeah. yeah, I think so too. So I'll be carrying this flag down with me for the second time. And, uh, you know, we're all guardedly optimistic with the new kit, the new team. Everything's gone into it that, you know, we have a better chance than last time of finding the endurance. Yeah. And those flags have amazing history. Those flags are sent on expeditions all around the world. Uh, some of them have been to the moon. So there's a lot of history behind those flags as well. So it's an honor yeah. to be able to carry one. It's very exciting. Yeah, indeed. I, I wish this one had been the moon. It's been everywhere else, but not the moon. But it's got a long history. You're right. All right. Good stuff. Well, maybe we'll bring a little luster to the flag as well. Of course. Well, Menton, let's, uh, we're going to switch to Q&A mode in just a moment, but I have a Kahoot quiz ready for the classrooms. So mm. um, some of the, most of the questions you'll have been able to answer from listening to us chatting today about the wreck. Uh, one of them might just be, you'll have to think about it a little bit, but let's, Let's have a little Kahoot competition here and see who can come out on top in this quiz. Uh, I'm going to post a link right here to Kahoot.it. So if you head over there, it's going to ask you for a PIN number, and I have one of those handy. I'm going to share my screen in just a moment. Uh, a reminder to everybody that uh, if you have one-to-one -one technology, that's great. You can play right at your seat or right at your house. If not, maybe your teacher can bring it up at the front of the room, uh, and you can shout out those answers. Um, but for now, let me get uh, set up here and let me share 
my screen and we will grab uh, we will grab that code. So here we go. All right, you should see it coming up now. And our code for today is right here. It is 2581824. 2581824, I see some students already starting to join us. We'll give about a minute uh, and see who's able to come in and join us. Here come some more students. Looks like we got students in New Jersey joining. That's cool. So four questions. There will be 30 seconds for each question. If you get the answer right, you get points. If you get it right really quickly, you get even more points. Uh, if you get it wrong, but you do it really fast, well, you still don't get any points. So we want to get it right uh, and we want to get it nice and quick. One of them's a thinker and then the other three you should be able to answer from Menson and I chatting today. So Menson, we're already up over 75 students. Let's see if we get to 100 and then we'll go live. Up over 80. All right, we're almost there, 97. There we go, 100 students, let's take this thing live. So here comes the first question, reminder, quickly find that right answer, here we go. Question number one, what was the name of Ernest Shackleton's ship? Was it the Explorer? Was it the Endurance? Was it Polar Wind or was it Nautilus? What is the name? of the ship that we are looking for. All right, couldn't fool our students today. The vast majority went endurance. That's absolutely correct. And looks like Dylan in New Jersey is in the lead. Let's jump into question number two. What percentage of Antarctica is covered in ice? Is it 50%? Is it 75? Is it 90? Or is it as much as 98% of Antarctica is covered in ice? Let's see how we do on this one. A couple more seconds. All right, a little bit of a split decision, but most students went with 98%, and that is absolutely correct. And then with the sea ice, the size of Antarctica doubles. Uh, each winter, which is pretty amazing. We had a shift. Looks like Smiley Face has taken the lead. Let's jump on to question number three. In what year was endurance crushed by the ice? Was it 1915, 1810, 1950, or was it not too long ago in 2000? All right, most students went with 1915. Our leaderboard shifting at the down below, but smiley face is holding down the fort. Let us go with our last question. Anything can happen. Ooh, so the underwater drone that is gonna be being used can reach depths. What do you think? 500 meters, 100 meters, 3000 meters, or 5000 meters. If you were joining us for our events with John or Chad, uh, you would 100% know the answers to this question, but let's see how deep you think that we're going to be exploring. Okay, we definitely had a few tuning in. 3,000 meters uh, is the depth that some of those underwater drones can reach. Let's look at our final leaderboard. Third place, Smiley Face. Second place, Gabe from Toronto. And holding down that top spot, we have Stefa. All right. Good stuff, everybody. Thanks so much for playing our Kahoot today. Let's come back from that screen share. All right, Menson, it looks like they were paying attention. There was a lot of a lot of good, fast answers today. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan from New Jersey was on the ball, wasn't he? That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, let's rock a little Q&A action. If you are joining us <laughs> via the live chat, send in those questions there and we will work them in there. Uh, in fact, let's just grab one right here before we go to our camera class. Miss Scales class is joining us, Menson, and they would like to know how long have you been doing your job and how many wrecks do you think you have been on? 
Hmm. Okay, well, I started directing in archaeology age 27. Uh, started with a, a wreck in Tuscany. Um, I, I was, I, I, it, it was an act of serendipity that I heard. This is your word for the day, serendipity. It means um, something unexpected but good happening to you. I heard about this wreck off Italy, off Tuscany. And that was my first, uh, and that was quite a successful uh, excavation. It was four years, and eventually there was a special exhibition at the National Archaeological Museum in Florence one summer, just on, on that wreck alone. And today, if you go to Italy and go to their National Underwater Museum, um, you'll find the entire top floor is devoted to that, that wreck, which I excavated back in the 80s. That was the first and how many after that, I, I really don't know. Excavated probably about 10 or something like that, surveyed many more, and number of wrecks I've seen would probably be close to 100 or something. <coughs> I see right. a lot of deep water wrecks on, on the, you know, in the bottom of the Atlantic and uh, places like that, but we don't have time to, to work, work on them, which is a shame because some of them are archaeologically important, but an awful lot is the answer. All right. Well, hopefully we have some future archaeologists out there who can uh, find some and, and and take some time because they're, I mean, the bottom of our ocean is just covered in uh, priceless history um, waiting mm -hmm. to be found. Absolutely. Okay. Let's jump to a camera classroom here. We're going to go to Mr. Giorgio's crew. They are in Oakville, Ontario, some grade six, sevens. I'm going to pop them here into the class, into the call. There they are. How are we doing, Oakville? Good to see you. Pretty good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> good, good. I'm good. Wow, that's a really nice classroom. Yeah. Nice on the walls. Yeah, yeah. thanks that's very good. much. Um, we have a couple questions. I'm not sure how many you, you have time to field, but the first one was, are you looking for anything specific on the ship? Um, well, there's a number of things which sort of take my fancy, uh, I admit, but we won't be touching anything. We won't be removing anything. Uh, our work is absolutely what we call non-intrusive. Uh, we won't be disturbing anything. Uh, but there are items on board which uh, which I'd really like to see. There was a bicycle on board owned by a man called Ord Lees, a rather unusual character, and he used to take the bicycle out on the ice. Uh, that, I believe, is still on the ship. Um, there are a lot of scientific samples that were collected by a man called Clark. He was a biologist and he kept them in honey jars. And all those honey jars with all those samples are there. Now, of those samples, which would I like to see most? Well, he had a, 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 a seal fetus in one of those jars, and that must still be there. Um, there, was, there were a couple of books left on the ship. One was a diary by a man called Maitland, volume one to his diary he left in his cabin. I'd love to see that. The captain of the ship, he used to sketch things, particularly other ships. He left his sketchbook behind. The ship's captain, uh, a man called Charlie, Charlie Green, he used to keep notes on all his recipes, especially the birthday cakes he cooked for the men on the ship. Each birthday cake was a little different and he used to hide things in the cake. And he kept notes and designs and drawings of all his birthday cakes. That book is still there on the ship. So there's a range of things like that, personal belongings and stuff I'd love to see. And so uh, one of the questions here in the chat uh, they're wondering about the depth that you're expecting to find the ship at. Yeah, I can be fairly precise about that. 3,000 meters, you know, give or take a, uh, 10 meters or so. And that uh, deep, cold water is going to preserve the wreck beautifully, isn't it? You're going to find it pretty well preserved. Down I, I will be surprised if it's not in good condition. I mean, you saw the photographs. She went down in a bit of a mess, and she will be a bit of a mess on the seabed. But in terms of her preservation, that should be excellent because of the cold, possibly because of the absence of water, but mainly because of the absence of uh, what we call marine uh, marine parasites, wood-consuming parasites, particularly uh, the teredo worm. <coughs> they don't exist in the Weddell Sea at all. <coughs> so she should be proud of the seabed and in pretty good condition. All right. I want to give a shout out Oh, actually, I was going to give a shout out to Miss Carol's class, but it looks like their devices are connected. They are joining us uh, from Thunder Bay, Ontario. I believe they're a grade eight class. How's everyone doing today? 
Nope. Miss Carol, can you hear us okay? All right. So maybe the microphone's not cooperating. I hear a little bit of a uh, kind of static. So Miss Carol, if you want to send your questions in via the private chat, uh, I will work some of those questions in. But for now, let's go to Miss Bowman's crew. Uh, they are joining us in Scotch Plains, New Jersey. So I have a feeling maybe Dylan from New Jersey might be hanging out in that classroom. Let's uh, let's bring them into the call here. Hi, Dylan. <laughs> there they are. Hi. hey everyone. Hi, this is so interesting. Um, Lexi has a question for you. Okay, so I have two questions. The first one is, do you ever think you're so close to finding a famous shipwreck, but then it's nothing? Uh, Joe, could you repeat that question? Yeah, she's wondering if you you ever think that you're so close to finding a wreck and then there's nothing, you don't find it. Yeah, uh, that has happened. We've spent quite a lot of time searching for wrecks and we never found them. And sometimes we felt that we were very close indeed. Um, yeah, um, as recently as just a few months ago, we were searching in the, in, in the uh, middle of the Atlantic and didn't find it. All right, yeah, it second question. It's frustrating. It's also very expensive. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question. Um, have you ever experienced something too cool or pretty that you thought you were dreaming? Joe, could you give me that again? Yeah, absolutely. So they're wondering, in your career, have you ever experienced something, you know, so amazing, so beautiful, you thought maybe you were dreaming? <laughs> uh, yes, the answer is uh, absolutely yes there. I remember once... Um, finding a little little vase about that size, literally, no bigger than your fist. And it was from Greece, from the city of Corinth, and it was painted with two fighting warriors. And I found it at 50 meters exactly in the sand by the wreck. And the really interesting thing was that I actually knew the man who had painted it. I don't mean I, I, I knew his name or him personally, but I knew his work. He was called the Little Warrior Painter, and I'd actually studied him at university. And there I was at 50 meters, actually holding one of his pots in my hand. And at that moment, you're kind of transported back over two and a half millennia back to ancient Greece. And it was kind of just magical. You know, it's, it's happened a couple of times. And once I found, I was working on Lord Nelson's ship, the Agamemnon. It was his favorite ship and uh, the ship upon which he fought the French was in his, with, it was at the Battle of Trafalgar with him. And in the bilge of the ship, a diver who was with me called Hector, uh, found a little insignia device and it had Nelson's name on it. That was another, wow. you know, just unbelievable moment. And I remember in the South China Sea once, I found the statuette of a seated Mandarin. Um, that was another incredible moment. And a lot of these things are, are in museums all over the world. There, there's over over 12 museums around the world which have collections of material which I have recovered from the sea. But even the British Museum in London has an item. So sometimes if I'm in the area of the British Museum, I'll go in there at lunchtime and sit there and eat my sandwich and look at something I excavated 25 years ago. In this case, it's, it's, a, it's a dragon sort of uh, rising. But yeah, right. there's been some great moments. Great question. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. We've got Mrs. Ross's crew joining us. They are, there they are. They are in Tavistock. They're fourth and fifth graders. Let's pop them in. I think I see someone at the camera. How's it going? Good. And good morning. Um, what inspired you to do this expedition? Oh, Shackleton, the endurance expedition. Well, uh, it goes back to childhood. I come from the Falkland Islands and everybody down there is a Shackleton enthusiast to one degree or another. Um, when I was your age, I was given a book as a Sunday school prize because of good attendance at church. And it was all about Shackleton. And I actually read it. And then as I grew up, I carried on being interested in the Shackleton story. And then, um, oh, this is exactly 10 years ago in August of this year, uh, I met a rather remarkable man in a coffee bar in South Ken. And he was the one who came up with the idea of searching for the endurance. My idea would be go searching for the uh, Terra Nova. Uh, his idea was, uh, no, forget the Terra Nova, let's go for the endurance. And the ironic thing is that I actually tried to talk him out of it. I remember saying to him, you know, that's, that's a crazy idea. She's under ice, you know, in the bottom of the Weddell Sea. You know, the technology is, 
is, is not ready for a challenge like this. And, but he's the kind of guy who doesn't, once he gets an idea in his head, he doesn't give up on things. And sure enough, a couple of years later, he came back and said, we're going for the endurance. And that's where it all began. Um, but yeah, Shackleton has always been something of a hero of mine. He's, he's a very interesting character. I admire him for his spirit, for his determination, for his courage, all those, those great qualities I like in him. All right. We're going to head to Maine now, Menson. We've got some fourth graders hanging out with us, uh, with Miss Merrifield. I'm going to pop them into the call. Uh, there we go. We're ready for you. How's it going, Maine? Um, Hi. Hi, guys. All right, go ahead. Um, why don't you take stuff from the ships and put them in museums? <laughs> yeah, we do that quite often, in fact. But it, it's, it's not as simple as that because museums can't take everything. You can't turn up at a museum, as I've done, with a couple of truckloads of artifacts from a shipwreck unless they're ready to receive it and want to receive it and have the conservation to receive it and are then able to curate it and look after it into the future. You have to have a very close relationship with museums to understand what their needs and requirements are and what they can handle. I've never seen a museum anywhere in the world which has spare storage space. So, you know, sometimes what I do is I just study the things on the seabed or occasionally we bring them up, study them, photograph, take them back down to the seabed again, uh, because really we don't know what to do with them after that. It's as basic as that. Um, we've left some very interesting things very reluctantly on the seabed, but that's the way it goes. Okay. Uh, a couple questions from YouTube here. We, Miss Turney's class is joining us and they're wondering two things. How long is it going to take to get from South Africa, uh, where you're leaving to the site in the Weddell Sea? And they're wondering how big Shackleton's ship was. Well, Shackleton's ship was 144 feet long. It wasn't huge, um, but she was very, very strongly constructed. Um, I, in fact, there's only one other ship that I'm aware of, wooden-built ship, which was as strong as the Endurance. <coughs> so not a big ship, but incredibly strong. She was a nice ship. <coughs> um, what was the other part of the question? Oh, how long does it take us to get there? Well, it depends on how fast we go. If, let's say, we travel at 10 or 11 knots, we can probably cover 1,000 nautical miles in four days. So depending on what speed we do, I think we should be able to reach the Weddell Sea in, let's say, um, 10 days, something like that. But how long will it take us to get the spot? That's another matter. That depends on how, how we cope with the ice conditions. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to check our class in Thunder Bay again, Miss Carol, and see uh, if we'll have a little better luck with the sound. Miss Carol, give me a wave if you're able to hear us okay. All right, I just don't think that the, the mic's connected, so hopefully they'll send us a question via the chat. But in the meantime, let's go back to Mr. Giorgio's class, because I know they definitely have another question for us. There they are. Sure, come on, Daniel. Um, Why don't you ask the first one there? We know most parts of the ship would go to the museum, but what would be the most valuable part that you would find? Oh, the most valuable part on the endurance. Yeah. Hmm. Or, or on any wreck, I'd imagine as well. Whose question was this? Nick, was this your question? Yes. Did you, were you referring to this expedition in particular or just any part that you would have found? Mostly this, but it could be any part. Yeah, he said mostly this, but it could have been on any expedition you've been yeah, on. Yeah, I think in this in this case, I'd like to get into the cabins if I was able to. Uh, we won't, and we won't touch anything. I have to stress that. But uh, I do know that the end of the endurance came very quickly, and some of the cabin, some of the cabins were flooded uh, in, in no time at all. And many of the team were not able to get back and save their personal belongings, their books, and all those things that were special to them. Um, that I'd find interesting. I'd like to get back into the, the photographer's studio, a man called Frank Hurley, because we know he left a lot of things behind within that studio, including some glass plate slides and possibly some uh, moving camera footage as well. And that was sealed in canisters. So it is possible that, you know, 
that it would be there in good condition. We have recovered uh, glass plate pictures from the Titanic, which were entirely legible. You could see them perfectly. So why not from the endurance? The holes were pretty empty, actually, of the endurance when she went down. Um, usually with shipwrecks, I get very excited by the galley area where you have all the cooking implements, all the foodstuffs, and the back of the ship where the captain lived, where all the navigational instruments and things of that nature were, were, were stored. Um, the personal belongings of the people uh, I always find very exciting. They kind of you know, bring it, you, you kind of make mind touch with the people on that ship at that time. Sometimes when you know people died on that ship, uh, it becomes a little, should we say, delicate. Um, and we have found wrecks with bodies on them. And then you kind of feel sometimes that you're, well, intruding. And that's not a comfortable feeling. But that's part of archaeology. Absolutely. Uh, Mrs. Ross's crew, I can see someone waiting up at the camera. So let's bring them in. Um. So what? what if the ice break what if the ice blocks the ship yeah indeed um that actually happened to us last time in fact um, on two occasions possibly three where the ship became ice bound and could not move forward or backwards uh, on one occasion we were becoming a little bit nervous we were almost two days locked in the ice and there were people on board who were beginning to wonder if <laughs> if our fate would not be the same as that of the endurance. And I remember people making rather uh, joking at the time that if we were stuck in the ice over winter, we'd have to start eating the seals and the penguins like they did on, on Shackleton's ship. So the problem for us is we're actually working right at the back end of the Antarctic summer, which is when the, uh, the big freeze starts. And we have to be very, very careful indeed not to be there when the Weddell Sea starts to freeze over completely. Because I think John talked about it in, in, in uh, his meeting with you, how the ice uh, at the beginning of winter just expands and expands and expands until eventually it completely surrounds the entire continent of, of Antarctica. So we do not want to be stuck in the ice at that time, that is for sure. All right, I'm going to bring in Mrs. Bowman's fifth graders. They just sent me a few more questions, so let's grab one of those. What waters do you find the most ships in? What was that one, Joe? What bodies of water uh, do, you, do you find the most ships in? Maybe, maybe where have you worked the most in your career? Uh, I suppose the Mediterranean is where I began, and my heart is more there probably than anywhere else. Um, uh, you know, I really enjoyed Roman and Greek shipwrecks, uh, medieval shipwrecks. Um, but I have worked elsewhere in the world. I've worked in the Caribbean. Uh, I've worked a lot in the Atlantic, the South Atlantic. Some years ago, I found a, a, a warship um, from World War I off the Falkland Islands, the flagship of the German squadron, which was sunk there in battle. That was a moment of great discovery. I enjoyed working down there. Um, East Southeast Asia, I also liked the Indian Ocean. I also found very challenging. Um, some of the river work I've done, I've really enjoyed. I spent a lot of time working in the River Plate, uh, where I was working on Lord Nelson's Agamemnon, which I mentioned before. But I also worked there on a a ship called the uh, the Graf Spee. It was a German ship that went down in the Battle of the River Plate in 1939. Uh, I worked on that for quite a while. I brought up one of her guns, which can now be seen uh, outside the Maritime Museum in Montevideo, Uruguay. And then some friends and I, a man called Sergio and a man called Hector, uh, we brought up the rangefinder from the very top of the control tower of the Graf Spee. And that can be seen in the docks of Montevideo to this day. So I've worked all around the world, um, but I think my favorite place is the Mediterranean. All right, and we'll grab a final question uh, from our crew in Maine, if they have one more for us, our grade fours. Oh, they came on, but then it looks like their device is disconnected. Let's try that again. Hmm. Hi. I have two quick questions. Okay, go for um, it. Real quick. 
Will your wife be joining you? <laughs> uh, uh, she's not in earshot right now, but I have to say there was nothing that would give me more joy than to have her with me. Uh, in all the early excavations, my wife and I worked together shoulder to shoulder. We began in maritime archaeology, but she now runs a family business in London. She's the CEO, so she's busy in commuting to and from London a lot. But if she could join me, she'd be with me like a shot. She's a, you know, an amazing person. And uh, I remember we were students together at Oxford and our first wreck uh, was really quite remarkable. There were times when we were without any money together. We sold everything we had except for her piano, which you can probably see in the background just there. We still have it. But you know, I remember going through that first winter with her, absolutely freezing because we couldn't pay the heating bill, trying to keep money together for our first excavation. And we've been together ever since. I'd love to do some more work with her, is the answer. All right, great question. And I think you said you had one more to squeeze in. Yes. Um, what's the most dangerous expedition you've been on? Um, there have been a few. I've had some, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. Well, I suppose I can talk about this. We have had some terrible accidents over the years, nasty ones. We have lost when you when you do thousands and thousands of dives, like I have. Then statistically, there will be accidents. It's inevitable. Um, we have on various projects lost three divers over the years um, for various reasons. One was a heart attack underwater. One was um, embolism. And another got caught in a freak wave. Um, we've seen some terrible accidents. Uh, on one site on the island of Monte Cristo, one of our divers got his fingers chopped off underwater. Same thing happened not so long ago at sea in the South Atlantic. I was standing beside a guy and a rope tightened around his hand and it took off his fingers. And I was right beside him. And for a moment, he nor I realized what had happened. We were cold. It was three o'clock in the morning. We were freezing. And... Uh, we had to take his fingers out of the gloves. Uh, I've been in rescue missions at sea not so long ago, actually, just a couple of years ago. We went to the rescue a yacht where two people were washed overboard, and we took one person on board, a lady whose, whose head had been pretty much stove in on one side, and we had to race her to hospital. Um, there have been encounters with sharks. I remember one wreck I was on, uh, I could see that, I could see on the side scan sonar that there was a bull shark in amongst the divers and I had to dive over and try to get the divers to abort the dive and get back quick because again it was one of those awkward sites where you couldn't see anything but you knew the shark was there amongst you and it was a bull shark and you know if you ask me which shark do I fear most the answer is bull sharks every time because I think they are creatures of instinct almost um, the great white, I don't think really is much interested in divers. Tiger sharks, which I've had several encounters with before, are actually fairly predictable. Once they start twitching and acting in an abnormal way, then you get out of the water quick. But bull sharks will just come at you out of left field and just whack you. I've had one of my team attacked by uh, a sea lion. If you read the books, they tell you sea lions don't attack divers. That's not true. It's happened to me twice. Um, we thought he was he'd be attacked by a shark, but you know we saw him being driven away from the ship, you know, screaming and shouting and waving and blood in the water. We thought it was a shark, and just as he released he released the diver, he rolled over, and we realized it was a it was a sea lion. So there are lots of dangers out there. Some of the fish are dangerous. I had one man on my team. This is going back quite a few years now. Who, um, who was excavating in a pit. And because a lot of debris had been thrown up in the water, he did not see that a scorpion fish got into the, into the hole, that he was, into the trench that he was excavating. And he put his hand right onto the back of the ship and drove the spines of the scorpion fish right up into his hand. And we got him ashore and he was absolutely um, screaming with pain. And he said to me afterwards, he said that if in that moment I'd handed him a pistol, the pain was such that we, he would have blown his brains out without a second's hesitation. I remember other accidents we've had where I remember three o'clock in the morning uh, telephoning the 
uh, Coast Guard at Chitavecchia in Italy trying to get instructions on how to inject morphine into somebody. And I remember the person at the other at the other end of the line, a doctor telling me, he said, well, have you got any fruit on board? Do you have any grapefruit or oranges? And I said, yes, we do. He said, well, practice on a grapefruit and then do that three times. And the first and the fourth time, do it for real, inject him with the morphine. So, yeah, I've, I've seen some terrible accidents and some awful things happen. So, yeah, it is, it is the dangers are there. I can't pretend otherwise. Well, there's, there's a reason why there's so many shipwrecks on the bottom of the ocean and really any body of water is uh it's it's unpredictable and then of course being out there and looking and and diving at those depths there's going to be risk and yeah bull sharks bull sharks love that murky water to hunt so i can see why you want to get them out of the water so quickly yeah uh, yeah absolutely well, try, try to explain to people underwater that there's a bull shark in the water with you and you've got to get up fast that was a hard one i ended up dragging them to the surface by their pillow yeah. valve all right well menson it has been an absolute pleasure to be connected with you today uh before we sign off i want to do a huge shout out to our classrooms on youtube so many great classrooms and great questions thank you for joining us and playing kahoot i want to give a shout out to our camera classrooms we have a few of them hanging around here i'm going to pop a couple in so they can give a big wave there they are thanks so much crew for hanging out with us uh live today it was good to see you and then Menson, we have a very exciting time coming up. I can't wait to do the events live uh, on the expedition. I'm going to share that link one more time in case classrooms aren't following along for the newsletter. So they're going to get all the updates. You can visit explore.reachtheworld.org. Make sure you get registered there. And then Menson, I guess the next time I'll see you, we'll be on board the ship, maybe even that's, out on the sea ice, which would be pretty cool. That, that's true, Joe. It's going to be exciting, whatever happens. So kids, stay with us. And um, Dylan in New Jersey, it's been great talking to you and uh, keep following what we're doing. All right. Have a great rest of the week, everybody. Have a great weekend. Uh, Menton, good luck on your preparation, safe travels, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone.